Welcome to the Peter King Podcast. I'm doing the pod remotely uh, this week. I'm on the road traveling a bit. Uh, and obviously, I'm joined by Miles Simmons, my partner on the Peter King Podcast. And uh, obviously, a very, very interesting week one, a consequential week one, uh, capped by the Aaron Rodgers uh, injury on Monday Night Football. And what an incredibly devastating 24 hours at MetLife Stadium for the two New York teams. We're going to get to that. I just want to set the stage a little bit in the podcast this week. We're going to be joined later in the pod by Green Bay Packers president, Mark Murphy, uh, who will go over quite a few things in our conversation when I was in Green Bay in training camp. I'm most interested, and I guess I'm a little bit of a schedule event nerd when it comes to this, but I really wanted to talk to Mark Murphy about the NFL draft, which will be in Green Bay in 2025. I'm just totally fascinated by the logistics, how in the world they're going to make that happen. So we'll get into that. We'll get into the quarterback situation. And obviously this was, I taped this long before uh, Jordan Love had such an impressive outing in the first game of the season for the Green Bay Packers winning decisively at Chicago. We'll talk about that a bit here, but Mark Murphy coming up later in the podcast. You know, Miles, welcome, and I I want to start by giving just a little bit of perspective on the Aaron Rodgers injury. On Friday, I spoke to Robert Sala, the coach of the Jets, and I asked him, how do you think you're going to feel coming out of the tunnel Monday night for the opener of this season? 9-11 9-11 in New York. Sala, as most people know, has a big history with 9-11. Uh, his brother was very nearly killed uh, in 9-11, but survived. And it changed the course of Robert Sala's life. I wrote about it in Football Morning in America this week. But I asked him how he felt. He's, you know, how do you think he you'll feel coming out of the tunnel? I don't want to give you his answer. He said, You know, good question. Before games, I get chills that run through my spine. I tell my wife, we're so lucky. I get to experience almost every human emotion you can experience in a four-hour period. The ultimate highs and lows. You know, really, what a gift to be able to do this for a living. It's going to be special. Very special. And... I kept thinking of that when I saw Aaron Rodgers sitting on the field on Monday night after he apparently, and we'll get the confirmation later in the day, you'll probably have it by the time we uh, you listen to this podcast, but um, the speculation, wide speculation, is that Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles and will be almost certainly lost for the year. So... I kept thinking about Robert Sala talking about the range of emotions, okay? And the range of emotions are so wide in any football game. But now just imagine your Robert Sala, your entire off season has been all about Aaron Rodgers coming onto the team and totally changing everything about this franchise obviously including expectations. So, Miles, there will be a lot of time to talk about what should the Jets do now, but tell me, A, your reaction, and B, oh, by the way, the Jets won the game. Yeah. I I mean, (laughs) So much of it is unbelievable, but what what were you thinking? Well, (laughs) I thought about that quote from Tom Moore, a longtime, obviously, offensive coordinator, now offensive assistant, and – uh, he, when you would say about Peyton Manning, you know, in backups, like we don't practice bleeped. Right. And yeah. you know, if, if 18 goes down, we're bleeped and we don't practice bleep. And like, that's kind of what happened last night. You know, if eight goes down eight being Aaron Rodgers' number now we're bleeped and we don't really practice that. And 
the thing is, Zach Wilson obviously has starting experience and, you know, his Jets teammates talked him up last night. And I think somebody and I, I can't remember exactly who I, I saw the quote from was like, oh, man, he's a starter on other teams and any other team. And I'm thinking like a starter in what league? Like, man, like that's the, that he's a starter I saw in the that XFL. last night. That's like, insane. Come on. <laughs> I, and I know it's his teammate. Yeah. But like, let's let's pump the brakes a little bit on that. Um, a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because look, Aaron Rodgers is a special player. He's a special guy. There, there's a reason why they went out and they traded for him. If Zach Wilson were going to be somebody that anyone thought could be a good starting quarterback this year, then Aaron Rodgers would not be with the New York Jets. So that's one thing that I thought. That was my first reaction. And the other was, okay, well, I guess the Bills are going to run away with this. And neither of those things really happened. I mean, Garrett Wilson saved Zach Wilson on that touchdown. And what an outstanding play that was by number 17 for the New York Jets. But then, you know, you just continue to see the Buffalo Bills and Josh Allen really keep them in that ball game. And when the Jets had opportunities, they took advantage of them. And that, to me, says a lot about the Jets as a team and why they really are a contending team if they have a good quarterback. So obviously we don't know what it is that they're going to do. Robert Sala said that Zach Wilson's going to be the guy. We'll see. I don't know. But just from that standpoint, you go through all those emotions and in that emotional roller coaster of losing Aaron Rodgers, and then, oh my gosh, what are we going to do to winning that ball game the way that they did? Man, you, you got to give Robert Sala a lot of credit for getting that Jets team prepared the way that it was because most teams are not going to be able to win that game after you lose your starting quarterback in that manner. You know, a few things about the game, Miles, that are just sort of when I consider what happened in this game, I I, I just find it startling that Josh Allen blew this game. It's just, huh. it's startling to me, you know, so let's, let's just, let's just go behind for a second and just think about this. All right. So we're at halftime and the Buffalo bills are ahead 13 to three and you're playing Zach Wilson. Mm -hmm. And in the second half of this game, and in overtime, Josh Allen had the ball six times. Now, let's keep in mind, the New York Jets are a top three, maybe a top one NFL defense. That is a terrific defense. But in the second half of this game, and in overtime, here were the six possessions that Josh Allen led. They ended interception, punt, interception, fumble, Field goal, punt. So needing basically six points to win this game in the third quarter in overtime, third, fourth quarter in overtime, Josh Allen struggled to three points. Okay, that's the first thing that bothers me. I think the second thing that bothers me, Miles, you, I may be one of the only people who noticed this, who saw this, but you tell me, if you saw it in the second quarter of this game, Josh Allen took off on a run. All right. And instead of darting out of bounds, he got and chose to try to get a yard or two more and got crunched by three New York Jets tacklers. And they panned to the sidelines and Sean McDermott is going like this. And Sean McDermott is saying to Josh Allen, okay, many people are just listening and not watching. I pointed to my head three or four times. In other words, that's Sean McDermott saying to Josh Allen, use your head. Yes. Don't go out half cock trying to get an extra two yards. Stop it. We talked about this all through the off season. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And, and again, that's me. That is me reading into what Sean McDermott uh, was doing with his body language. But I think that's probably pretty close to the reality of it. So those two things, 
the mistakes by Josh Allen and his judgment. I mean, it's one thing to lose a game. That in so many ways for the Buffalo Bills was a really disturbing loss. It, absolutely, Peter. And, and I got one number for you, and it's 84. That's the number of giveaways that Josh Allen has had since the start of the 2018 season, and it is more than any other quarterback after week one. Any other quarterback. Jared Goff is second on that list. And, you know, I mean, I saw some Cowboys writers saying, well, Dak Prescott, you'd think he'd be up there with the way we talk about Dak Prescott's turnovers. He's not even in the top five. Josh Allen has had these issues dating back to however, whatever season you want to go to, right? The, the best he looked was when Brian Dayball and he really got going and really got things together. And then Brian Dayball up and leaves to become the head coach of the New York Giants. Now, that's great for Brian Dayball. But what you have to do if you're Josh Allen is not turn the ball over like right. this. He kept cool. doing it late in last season, and I was talking about it. And every time I would, the Buffalo Bills fans would get on me. It tweets, it was this, it was that. Well, Josh, uh, J Patrick Mahomes turns the ball over. He has interceptions. So does Joe Burrow. It's not just the interceptions. It's the fumbles, and it's the decision-making. And when you have a chance – as the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills, right? Garrett Wilson makes an incredible catch, but they've still got Zach Wilson at quarterback, okay? They may have tied the game, but all you need to do is go down the field and get a touchdown, and you probably put that game away, right? And the first thing that they do is Josh Allen drops the snap, then picks it up, tries to run, and fumbles it again. And they get the possession, and they score a field goal, and they take the lead. This is the kind of thing that you need to be extremely concerned about if you are the Buffalo Bills. And Josh Allen, you know, he said in the post-game press conference, it's the same stuff and it's eerily similar to last year and I let the team down and he owned it and I, I give him credit for that. But at this point, this is who Josh Allen is. Yeah. And until we see something different and until Josh Allen proves otherwise, then he's going to continue to cost his team games in manners like this. And that, that's why, to me, the Buffalo Bills are not at that upper echelon of AFC teams right now because they continue to show that they will turn the ball over in critical situations. It's just not good enough right now. And Josh Allen knows it. So, I mean, <laughs> look out, Raiders, because this, team, this team's going to be coming after you in the first half of next week. And, yeah, I think that they'll bounce back. And maybe this will be the wake up call that they needed, but I don't know how you can't be extremely concerned if you're a Buffalo Bills fan today. All right. So miles, I want to transition into look, it, 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 let me stop myself and just basically say, if we were WFAN in New York right now, we would have a 45 minute cry fest about <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, And we could talk about, Oh my God, what a, awful thing what a what a you know what a quasi sporting tragedy there's only two other things i want to say because everybody knows that's just one of the weirdest awful terrible things on the fourth snap in of saviordom aaron Rodgers goes down you know exactly 24 hours after the new york giants showed everybody who we thought they were and I'm exaggerating a little bit. I didn't know what the Giants would be this year, but reality is set in in at MetLife Stadium. Um, you know, another same old football season <laughs> with the Giants and Jets, unfortunately. But I do want to just have two points, two last points to make about Rodgers and, and about the Jets, right? So Aaron Rodgers turns 40 years old in December. When you turn the clock back a, a quarter century, you turn the clock back to Dan Marino, an aging, great quarterback, tearing his Achilles late in his career, and he was never the same. And a lot of people, I think, have said uh, and wondered in the hours, in the day or so after the injury to Aaron Rodgers, well, assuming it is an Achilles tear, what will he be like coming back at age 40? Because obviously, you, you know, as you get older, it's harder to come back from debilitating injuries. And I don't think anybody truly knows 
what Rodgers will be like, other than I'll just say two things. Number one, I will be utterly shocked if Aaron Rodgers stops playing football, if he announces his retirement or if whatever. He's he is in love with football right now. Um, and coming into this season, and he's in love with being a quarterback in New York. He's in love with quarterbacking the New York Jets. So I don't see any way, barring some physical calamity, that he stops playing football. That's number one. He, it, I, I believe, Miles, that Aaron Rodgers feels a closer kinship to Tom Brady right now entering this season. And, and again, look, who knows how he feels right now because he's obviously devastated. I believe he feels a closer kinship to Tom Brady than he ever has as a as a competitor with him in his career because as he told me in training camp Tom Brady and what he was able to do really has been enlightening for me um and what he meant is he sees why somebody can still be in love with the game this late in his career and how he can physically still do it this late in his career so that's one thing the second thing is a totally 180 degrees different. If you look at the New York Jets schedule, you start to ask yourself, as a football fan, oh my God, the Jets are America's team this year. They're on national TV a thousand times. And so what can the NFL flex out of? Okay. And so I went and, you know, you, you look up because sometimes you know, the flexing rules are a little bit bizarre. Okay. But, uh, and, and they're very, and they're malleable. They changed coming into this year, just to let you know, the NFL can flex games on Sunday night football between weeks five and 10. And then also the NFL can flex games from weeks 11 to 17. Okay, so in other words, from week five to 17, it's possible that games can be flexed. Monday night football can be flexed at the NFL's discretion between weeks 12 and 17. And Thursday night football, it could be used twice, um, up to twice between weeks 13 and 17. Now, I think most of us felt coming into this year, you know, they're not going to flex Thursday night. It's it's a horrible thing for fans. It's terrible, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the Jets and their schedule could be flexed under the current rules twice. In week 10, the Jets are at Las Vegas on Sunday night football on NBC. That game easily could be flexed, especially if the Jets are, are struggling and you know, unless the unless the Vegas Raiders really, uh, you know, go on a run. So that's number one. Week 10, Sunday night football, Jets at Vegas. Also, Thursday night, week 17. So in other words, the last Thursday night game, basically, potentially, that could be flexed, is the Jets at Cleveland. And... You know, for that game right there, that is a really interesting candidate to be flexed because you would think, you'd think that unless Deshaun Watson plays great and he's got to play a lot better than he did on Sunday, and he might, uh, you know, that could be a real candidate for flexing. But those are the two games that America may be able to see an alternate game on any of those two, uh, either of those two. And the final thing I would say about this is I just feel a lot of times like I'm not a big believer in, oh, the gods are at play in this game or anything like that, or the Jets are cursed, anything like that. It just shows, in my opinion anyway, that everything that happens in sports is unscripted. You just don't know. That's why we love sports. Yeah. 
And I hate to say that after Aaron Rodgers goes down with a crushing, debilitating, franchise-rattling injury. I get it. It's horrible. But, and again, look, we could talk about the turf. My problem in talking about the turf, Miles, is you. we can all speculate that this wouldn't have happened if it was grass, but we don't know. We, don't. we just don't know. And so I'll leave that for, um, you know, people who are adamant that every field should be grass and this injury never would have happened on grass. The fact is, nobody knows whether the torque that happened when Leonard Floyd sacked Aaron Rodgers would have been any different on grass uh, and whether this injury would have happened on grass. You, you simply don't know. You can speculate, and it's a good argument saying that every field should be grass. That's fine, but you can't say that this injury wouldn't happen on grass. Anyway, I've gone on far too long. I'm going to give you the last word on Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. Well, I, I think it just shows that football can be a cruel game, man. I mean, it it's wonderful. It's amazing. It's my favorite sport. I love it. I love all the, the games given me. And, you know, I, I, I feel very fortunate to make a living talking about it, but Man, you know, when you see something like that and how terrible it is and how it obviously affects the mentality of everybody up and down that jet sideline, right? I mean, and not just on the sideline, but, you know, you go up a little higher to the coach's box right? and then also to the owner's suite. That affects everybody. So when they are still able to win a game like that, I just love that that's what football is. You yeah. know, because Great. you can still go from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs where an undrafted free agent makes the team and ends up winning the game on a punt return. Isn't that cool? In overtime, in MetLife Stadium on Monday night football. That's beautiful. It, it's like it's it's melancholy and it's sad in one way. But the fact that that's how the game ends is just it's poetic and it's beautiful. Also, I don't know. It's funny, Xavier Gibson that you talked about, the guy who won the game with the punt return. What I think is the coolest, coolest, coolest thing about that, uh, right after the uh, the Hard Knock show aired where the Jets cut their roster and Xavier Gibson made the team, I texted Robert Sala and I said, first of all, I, I, I thought that Hard Knocks was really good this year, in part because the Jets kind of embraced it. They said they weren't. But then Aaron Rodgers thought, hey, they can see the truth about Aaron Rodgers. And so he got into it. And the coolest thing was the relationship between the two free agent receivers, and obviously Gibson's also a returner, who made this team. And two free agent undrafted wide receivers made a, te made a team that was going to contend strongly, I thought, for a division title. Mm -hmm. And I just told Sala that it was great and that, you know, Bill Parcells always used to say, once you get in this room, meaning the uh, the start of training camp, once you get in this room, I don't care where you were drafted. Mm -hmm. I don't care uh, how much money we paid you. I'm going to keep the best 53. And the Jets did that. And last night it rewarded them on one of the most star-crossed days in the history of the franchise. I'm sure the most star-crossed day in the history of the franchise. They won the game because of a decision they made with keeping a guy who entered training camp is probably the 87th guy on the roster. You're right. That is the beauty of what football is all about. So, Miles, we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the rest of the NFL in a moment. And we're going to talk about a lot of the good, the Niners, the Cowboys, Miles Simmons, former team, the Los Angeles Rams, getting a huge win. The Cleveland Browns dominating, embarrassing the Bengals again. Jordan Love's debut. Tua's incredible performance. So many good. But we're not going to ignore the bad. We're not going to ignore the Giants nightmare. Joe Burrow, why was he so lousy? The angry Vikings. The angry Bears fans. We're going to talk about all the good and all the bad when we come back on the Peter King podcast. So, 
Miles, now that we've had time to digest uh, sort of the results of week one, I'm left with this thought, this overriding thought. We spend seven or eight months in the off season, seven months to be fair, after the Super Bowl and before the start of the next season. We spend all that time pumping up, examining, mostly in a very positive way, because everybody knows that most teams have reason to be optimistic entering a season. Uh, you can find reasons. And so those reasons are often found. And I think an awful lot of us thought that, you know, boy, the Giants coming off that great year last year, surprising. Now they're a little bit better. And wow, what might the Giants do this year? Will they finally be competitive in the NFC East? Oh, the Bears, this is the best supporting cast that they've had there in a long time. Justin Fields, he's got a real chance. Oh, the Vikings, they, you know, now with, with Aaron Rodgers out of the division, finally now it's their division to dominate. So, yeah, and, you know, uh, all these other teams too, you know, had reasons for optimism in the Steelers and, and all this. But I think what week one does is it's sort of, you know, it's when you check into a hotel room and they have in many uh, bathrooms, they have the makeup remover and they have the makeup cloth. And so, and it's not anything that I have to deal with, <laughs> but I love where this is going. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you know, you can basically wipe away uh, what you, know, you, you had on that day, you wipe away and you just come down to the base. You come down to who you really are not who you are made up to be. Yes. And look, I realize that is mostly a woman thing, but it's just what I think of when I think of the first week of the season, which is now the harsh reality slaps everyone in the face. And for some people, they're deliriously happy after week one. And some are asking, oh my God, when's the draft? <laughs> and but but so I I just I wanted to I wanted just to mention that, and I also wanted just to 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 sort of say a sentence or two about the six teams and and or entities <clears throat> that I thought had really good days, and then we'll get into some of the teams that had a bad day. But Miles. Let's just ping pong a little bit on this briefly. I'm going to go over and I, I'll I'll start with the San Francisco 49ers. I thought the Niners had the most impressive day of any team in football overall because they had a fairly mayhem training camp, traded Trey Lance and all, and went out. And my takeaway from 30 to 7. San Francisco over a good Pittsburgh team uh, at, uh, you know, at Pittsburgh, my takeaway is maybe some teams just operate better in adversity and mayhem. And maybe the 49ers are that team because they look really good. They, they looked fantastic. I mean, you pointed out in your column how good of a day Brandon Ayuk had. I, I thought he was simply outstanding. And, you know, we obviously he had the block on the Christian McCaffrey run, which was huge. And I think that that's something that San Francisco, you just absolutely love to see that as an organization. But just the way he was able to get open, you know, and just be that completely reliable target for Brock Purdy. And Brock Purdy, I mean, he didn't show any signs of right. elbow anything you know elbow injury elbow fatigue whatever you want to call it the, the plan that they had him on from surgery to week one it clearly worked you should feel really good if you're the 49ers right now because I don't think Pittsburgh is going to get dressed down like that by many opponents but for San Francisco to come in from the west close play at 10 o'clock body body clock time it was so yeah. bad that they didn't even get to renegade at Heinz or Akersher Stadium or whatever they call it now <laughs> it's not Heinz Field anymore so I mean like that that to me says just how good of a day that San Francisco had when you can come in there and beat the brakes off the Steelers like that no, nobody usually breaks the beats the brakes off the Steelers at home like that it, it doesn't happen much 
the best defensive performance I thought by far was the Dallas Cowboys against the Giants. They hold the Giants to 171 extraordinarily ugly yards. Yeah. They intercept uh, Daniel Jones twice. They sack Daniel Jones seven times. Uh, they force five fumbles. Look, the New York Giants uh, might be awful. Really, they might be awful. You know, what nobody is really talking about with the Giants, honestly, is that their right tackle situation with Evan Neal, mm -hmm. it's almost at an emergency level. They, It's going to be hard for them to keep him outside. He's just slow. He is a slow-footed football player. But the positives for the Cowboys, I think, which I are many, I just don't know what that victory means. I mean, keep this in mind. Mm -hmm. Cowboys only gained 265 yards in this game. This was a game that was basically handed to them by their defensive front and by the Giants' inability to protect Daniel Jones. Yeah, it, it looked so ugly. I mean, you say he gets six sacks seven times. It felt like 20. I mean, every time he got he dropped back to pass, it was like, oh, no, please leave Danny alone. My gosh, what are you doing? And why do they keep sending him out there into the fourth quarter? I mean, put the backup in, for goodness sakes. That's what at least what uh, Cincinnati did with Joe Burrow and Jake Browning. But I think with Dallas, that's a game that you say, all right, we did what we needed to do but let's keep it rolling. How can we keep improving? Because that's not going to be the story of every game this season, that dominance. I mean, yeah, I think it's great. And this is one of the reasons why I, I think Dallas is going to be really good this year. You have the third year of Dan Quinn as defensive coordinator. I think that makes a significant difference, right? It's not like he's just coming in or he's just seeing, or he's just doing da, 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 da. He understands the personnel. He understands the personalities of guys and what they can do well already so it's not like you're going from step a to step you know five or whatever it is you understand how good that these guys can be you're already at the four thousand level class well let's continue to build that so I, I think the dallas cowboys can still be good and they can build off of that but you can't just look at that and say okay well that's how it's going to be every single week you know you have to make sure that you're taking that seeing it for what it is but saying all right well it's not going to be like that. We got to make sure we say it on, on our P's and Q's and, you know, not read our press clippings a little too much. The Los Angeles Rams hey. went into Seattle. And I don't know if the right word is dominate because I don't think it was quite domination, but wow. I watched a lot of this game. And the Rams in this game, to me, I, I might argue they were the most impressive team of any team in week one because of what I thought the Rams were entering this season. I thought they were going to be four and 13 and they went into a team that I really liked a lot. Seattle, they outgained Seattle by 246 yards outgained them by that. Okay. And they out first downed them. 27 to 13. They had two receivers America has never heard of, as I wrote in my column. They're available in 100% of all fantasy leagues. You know, <laughs> Haka Nakua and Tutu Atwell. Well, what happens? Matthew Stafford comes out and he throws to them 23 times. No Cooper Cup, no problem. And they combined for 238 receiving yards. And talking to Matthew Stafford after the game, he said to me, basically, this is the greatness about the NFL. You can talk, say whatever you want in the offseason, but then the truth really happens in the first game. And I think one of the truths of week one is that the Rams are a lot better and a lot more physical, Miles, physical, than we thought they would be entering this season.
you know, that's going to be the real test is how physical are they going to be uh, in this coming week, week two against the 49ers at SoFi Stadium? Because that's really where things have been imbalanced yep. in recent years, with the exception of the 2021 NFC Championship game. The 49ers have just bullied, bullied, bullied the Rams. And I expected this game to be close between the Rams and the Seahawks because in my mind, the circle of life over the last seven years in the NFC West has been Sean McVay beats Pete Carroll, who beats Kyle Shanahan, who beats Sean McVay, and they all beat up on the Cardinals because that just seems to be what's happened. And now, I mean, you have a ton of coaching stability in this division because McVay and Shanahan have been there since 2017. And, you know, Pete Carroll's basically been there since time immemorial at this point when it comes to NFL and head coaches. So the result didn't necessarily surprise me in terms of a Rams win, but what did surprise me, and I would say that the Rams were dominant is because the Seahawks, as you mentioned, had so many fewer yards than the Rams, but they had nine total yards in the second half and, and uh, excuse me, 12 total yards in the second half. And nine of them came on the last play of the game. They had three yards in the second half for basically all of it until that last garbage time play. That to me is pretty dominant. And when Geno Smith is saying, oh my God, because Aaron Donald is coming at him unblocked, I think that might be a little dominant too. Yeah. The Cleveland Browns, your hometown Browns, um, they embarrassed the Bengals to the point that Zach Taylor in the fourth quarter actually took a healthy Joe Burrow, fairly healthy Joe Burrow out. Two things I thought about this game from Cleveland's standpoint. I watched a lot of this game and Deshaun Watson was not good. And he played exactly the way he played late last year. The thing about Deshaun Watson that's interesting right now is he is bouncing footballs in front of receivers. Where does that come from? I don't know. But he's doing it. Um, and But I think the most interesting thing is, I wrote about this in my column, the Cleveland Browns had uh, historically against Joe Burrow in the previous five meetings, had blitzed them 18 times. New defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz blitzed them 30, eight, I'm sorry, 18% of the snaps, 18%. And in this game, it was 39%. New defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz. And so I think that really flustered Burrow uh, to be blitzed significantly more. Plus, I just don't think he's fully healthy with that calf injury. And it has to be in the back of his mind. He said after the game, it was good enough. Mm -hmm. So your takeaways from the Cleveland Browns. Well, I thought it was a dominant defensive performance. And one thing I loved was how Jim Schwartz used the personnel up front. You know, Miles Garrett, dominant defensive end. We know that. But he was moving all around the formations. And that's something that he has not necessarily done as much in the past. I, yeah. I thought it was interesting, you know, last year when Jadevian Clowney was say, had a quote, something to the effect of, well, they want the coaches want to put Miles Garrett in the Hall of Fame. I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, you use your personnel in yeah. ways that are going to help you win, right? So if Miles Garrett is as great as he is, and he is great, then don't you want to put him in favorable positions yeah. because that's going to help your team win? And so I thought that was great. And there's obviously the clip going around on social media of Miles Garrett, like, you know, doing a crossover move like he's in basketball yeah. before he yeah. gets up to the line and crosses the center's face and then gets right into the backfield. And he doesn't end up making the play, but somebody else does. So I thought that was tremendous from Jim Schwartz, just the creativity of how do you use your personnel up front to cause real confusion along that offensive line and make sure that Joe Burrow is pressured. And the conditions might have had something to do with how weird things seemed offensively for both teams. I mean, if you're Deshaun Watson, you can't Tebow the ball in there like he has been, you know, with these things yeah. skipping into these receivers. I hate to see that. But, you know, apparently it was not supposed to rain during that game at all, talking to people from Cleveland over the you know last couple of days. And then it just did. And it just seemed like it was only over Cleveland Brown Stadium that the rain just fell consistently throughout that game. So that might have had something to do with the way things went for both offenses. When you're not anticipating rain like that and then it rains, it messes things up. But I think if you're the Browns, you can feel real good. If you're the Bengals, 
you just say, look, that's one game. It happens to us in Cleveland. Last Halloween, it was also a dismantling. We moved on from it. We'll move on from it again. And, you know, it's only week one. We can be all right. Jordan Love, Green Bay Packers. First game as the successor, the heir to Aaron Rodgers. And I use this explainer. If you're a 38-year-old, huge Packers fan, uh, your whole life you've lived in Wisconsin, you've only known basically two quarterbacks over the last 31 years. And that's Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. So now you think, okay, now I take my medicine and we'll deal with Jordan Love. But I don't know why there were so many people who were quick to dismiss Jordan Love. He was a little shaky coming into the year. He didn't have a great training camp. However, you know, if you go back and you read Bob McGinn and other writers in 2006, 2007, they were a little skeptical about Aaron Rodgers just because he wasn't that impressive in training camp. And what does Jordan Love do in a game against his arch rivals? Uh, has the best passer rating in the NFL in week one. Throws for three touchdowns, no interceptions. 38 to 20 dismantling of the Chicago Bears. Your quick thoughts on Jordan Love. I thought he was great, and he he was great when he needed to be. And, and you know, going into that game, you don't know what Jordan Love is going to be. And the, there's an unknown for the Packers, too, of who is Jordan Love going to be once he's the starting quarterback. And I think if you go through that game, you see the throws that he makes, you know, the throws into tight windows, how he was commanding the huddle, you have to feel good coming out of it. And Look, if you're the Bears, man – I don't, I don't know what to do. I just, I'm kind of at a loss for that franchise, that organization. And I'm curious to see what they look like over the next two, three games in the first quarter of the season. But I guess, you know, if Aaron Rodgers owned the Packers before, then I guess it just gets passed down to whoever is the next QB one. Cause it sure looks like Jordan love owns the bears too. Let's spend a minute on Tua Tonga Valoa and the Miami dolphins going to LA and getting a 36 34 victory over the Chargers. Uh, part of what I would say is, well, you know, same old Chargers. The defense was crushingly disappointing, but I thought Tua Tongavaloa played a great game. I thought his best pass of the day was his last touchdown pass to Tyreek Hill in the end zone, closely guarded Tyreek Hill, where it was a beautiful touch pass by Tongavaloa, and Tyreek Hill had to battle to catch it, but it was in an absolutely perfect spot. Look, that game proved to me, with Tua throwing for 466, that game proved to me beyond the shadow of a doubt, if Tua Tongavaloa stays healthy, he is going to be at the very top, I don't know what, two, three, four quarterbacks in the NFL and, and look, one of the reasons you don't want to go too crazy about week one is that it's a very simple reason that Tua Tagovailoa has basically missed a month of each of his seasons as a starting quarterback in the NFL, and he has to stay healthy. The greatest sign to the greatest point for Tua, and I mentioned this to Mike McDaniel, who caught him for a few minutes uh, on their bus ride to the airport for the trip to, back to Miami. The best thing uh, is that Tua not only wasn't sacked in this game, he was not hit hard in this game. And so I think those are very, very good signs for the Miami Dolphins going forward. I I agree with you. I, I would temper though the, the Tua praise in a little bit of a way because to me, the, the Miami Dolphins should have won that game by more. I think that that game almost should have been a laugher. But you had Tua Tunga by Loa mishandled two snaps on the opening drive. The first was yeah. a penalty, so it kind of didn't count. But the second ended up being a turnover. And it's, you know, in the red zone. I think that they were inside the five-yard line when that happened. And you can't have that happen. So it didn't happen the rest of the day. So it's one thing. But, like, that to me, that's an issue. And the second is the picky through to J.C. Jackson when you're in deep in plus territory. That's another one of those throws where it's just like, mm, I, almost, I, I think that that's just one he would want back. So this, yeah. those are two really good scoring opportunities 
that they just did not have because of those decisions by the quarterback. But then how do you respond, right? So he throws that throw that you mentioned, you know, to Tyreek Hill, but on that same drive right before it, third and 10, basically it's a do or die play. You got to have it climbs the pocket really well and then finds Tyreek Hill streaking down the right side. And Tyreek Hill had an outstanding day with 215 yards. So that throw also I thought was outstanding. It was great. You just need to see that consistency from Tua Tonga by Loa from the start of the first quarter until the end of the game, because I mean, in theory, he could add 500 yards passing in yeah, that game. That's easy. how good he was. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, we, I originally drew a line of demarcation between the good and the bad. Unfortunately, we've talked a lot about the bad while we talked about the good, but there's one team left that I thought had a very ignominious week one. And that is the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, you know, I, I was fairly impressed with the Vikings defense and what they did in this game, because really, and again, look, Tampa is, I think really going to struggle this year, getting anything done on offense, but to hold any team in the NFL, to 242 yards is a really good accomplishment. I just thought what bothered me about this game is that, look, Tampa Bay's strength is their defense, so I get it, okay? But but let's just, let's just talk about, you know, in my opinion, like when I, I did not watch this game from start to finish, but I, I have red zone on, and every time I look up, Kirk Cousins losing a snap from center, fumble. Yeah. You know, they lost two fumbles in this game. Cousins threw a bad interception in the third quarter. Is there a good interception, by the way? But wow. anyway, he threw a bad interception going in, okay? And, you know, so, and and obviously that totally changed the game because that interception happened late in the third quarter and the Bucs uh, went down the field right after that uh, and, uh, and, and sort of changed, you know, the momentum a little bit in this game. So to me, I... I would be kind of worried if I were the Vikings. I wouldn't be petrified. I thought Brian Flurry's defense had a good day. But man, you know, the Minnesota Vikings with a home game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to start the season cannot come out and score 17 points and really cannot come out and lose that game. Well, yeah, I mean, and your team has Justin Jefferson and that's, you know, the yardage that you finish with. That's, that's a bit of a problem. You know, I, I, I noticed too, that there were a lot of just mishandled snaps around the league. I obviously yes. mentioned that one from Tua Tonga Vailoa too, but it just seemed like it happened a bunch around the league in week one. And I don't know what kind of trend that is, but that's one that would drive me absolutely nuts. If I were a coach and you keep seeing things like that, where the snap can't even get right like that. Yeah. We, we can't have that. We absolutely cannot have that. So I, I don't know what this game, you know, between the Vikings and Bucks is going to look like at the end of the season. I kind of feel like it might be one of those games where it's like you look back and you're like, how did that happen? Because yeah, the Vikings should be good, yeah. you know, and the Bucks should not. So yeah. we'll see how that ends up. Uh, Miles, we are going to get to um, my guest this week, Mark Murphy. One of the things that I think is interesting, and you listen to, to Mark Murphy, is um, if you go to Green Bay, for those people who have an opportunity to go to Green Bay, and a lot of people listen to this either can't, won't, uh, may never be in Green Bay in their lives, just understand that this area has really undergone a transformation. And it is a little bit now a tech hub, uh, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, Microsoft has invested a lot of money uh, in a business in Green Bay. Uh, the area right around the field is so incredibly different uh, than it was when I started covering football. So Green Bay is a, is a fascinating place, and it's a great example of what happens to a place when you have an NFL franchise. Anyway, here's my conversation with Mark Murphy. Back on the Peter King Podcast, so happy to be joined by Packers President Mark Murphy as we sit here with Lambeau Field in the background. And Mark, I just have to tell you from a very selfish standpoint, yeah. 
The best hotel in the National Football League right now that I stay at is, is Lodge Kohler. And you Kohler guys, family would be very glad to hear that. And I'll, no, I'm I'll telling you, it is. <laughs> and, and oh, everything, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Everything that has been done in this title town district mm -hmm. is just absolutely phenomenal. For those people mm -hmm. who have not been here and who are not watching, you're only listening, mm -hmm. you've got to come and see this at some point. You've got to come and see what has happened. It used to be that Lambeau Field was just this mm -hmm. island in this town of 100,000 people mm -hmm. in northeast Wisconsin. But now it is really a destination place. So we are in right here. We are in the Titletown District, and we're going to talk to the Packers president about the Packers and about a venture that I'm fascinated mm -hmm. with, which is the 2025 draft being held in Green Bay. But, Mark, let's start off by just asking about the massive changes yeah. with the football team this year and basically in the last couple of years. Had a conversation earlier with Brian Gutekunz, the general manager, and said, you know, there aren't a lot of teams in the NFL mm -hmm. that are run primarily kind of as a continuum. Mm -hmm. You know, you obviously you want to win, but yeah. you know there are a lot of franchises that would say, hey, wait a minute. We got Aaron Rodgers. We're going to ride till he dies yeah. and all that. But the way this franchise has worked going back years, and it happened in 2008 when Brett Favre wanted to come back, mm -hmm. and you guys said, wait a second, we got to start anew with Aaron Rodgers. We've made done, a commitment to Aaron. Yeah. yeah, and you've done it now, draft and develop Jordan Love, and it's time to play. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this from the standpoint of – what the Packers organizational philosophy is about developing players and then playing them. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, we are very fortunate as an organization to have gone from one hall of fame quarterback to another. We realize that's not the norm, but, um, and Aaron, obviously phenomenal, uh, four time MVP, Super Bowl MVP. Um, but you know, I, I think there's an old saying in the NFL and you're probably aware of it is, and, a part, and it's even more important now, given the importance of the quarterback position in our league. But the old saying was, the best time to draft a quarterback is when you don't need one. And you really, if you look, I mean, that's kind of the philosophy that, you know, you're always, you're, you're planning to play well now and compete, but you always have an eye on the future. And uh, Brian, Brian got a lot of criticism when we drafted Jordan Love. Your general manager, Brian Gudikins. Yes, and, but... You know, I, I say to fans, where would, we, where would we be now if we hadn't done that? And, you know, we still haven't seen a lot of Jordan, but uh, I think uh, we're all excited about uh, the future. And, you know, you mentioned it's uh, a lot of, this is a very different team, a lot of transition. We're pr very young, particularly on offense. And, uh, but with that comes uncertainty, but also excitement. I, you know, here we are, second week of training camp, but I, I think, I think our fans are more excited about this season than any season we've had recently, just because there's so much unknown and uh, really, ex and you know, we're young, but we've got really talented young players and uh, really excited to, to see, particularly as, you know, with Jordan, uh, you know, see how, and, and you know this, the other thing in the league is, uh, and you've seen this, when, when you play a quarterback too soon, loses confidence, you know, I think with both Aaron and now Jordan having the having the to be able to sit behind a Hall of Fame quarterback and watch him and learn from him, you know, Jordan is in a much different position than he would have been had we thrown him in as a starter three years ago. Yeah, and that was COVID year. I mean, so that was really was really tough on rookies then. Mark, I had I heard the other night at the family night. Yeah, uh, where. Oh. 70,000 fans go or 60 to 70 go every year to simply watch a practice. And uh, I heard there was a tremendous outpouring for Jordan Love. It, it, it was palpable. And it was, and it, it was following the, the practice. Um, we interviewed a couple different players, and Jordan was one of the players that we interviewed. And, uh, yeah, I, I would say it was a standing ovation. I mean, the people were just they, – they like Jordan, and they want him to have success. It's interesting – that that would happen with a guy who they don't even know. 
Yeah. What is it about Jordan Love that well, Green Bay our fans likes? follow. Our fans, you know, they they know a lot. I think they like. Uh, he's humble. Uh, he's very uh, appreciative of his teammates, and uh, you know, the the times that he's played. I think particularly uh, this two years ago he started and <laughs> had an up and down game, but uh, this past year when Aaron was hurt when we played the Eagles. Uh, Jordan stepped in, and uh, it was impressive. So yeah. I think, although we haven't seen a lot, I think there's there's a lot of optimism there that uh, he can can do well. So Mark, let's discuss the Green Bay Packers' successful bid to land the NFL mm-hmm. draft uh, in Green Bay in 2025. And I know that a lot of people, when this happened in mm-hmm. the spring they said how in the world can you have a draft in green bay when the draft has been in places like nashville mm-hmm. there's 600,000 people what will happen <laughs> when 600,000 people go to green bay well i don't know that well, we're estimating will. we'll get 250,000 yeah, that's still yeah. quite a bit but but mm-hmm. i've heard at the time when i read about it that it's being thought of as just kind of a grandiose football weekend yeah but I say, well, wait a second. On a football weekend, you've got sixty-five or seventy thousand fans coming in, yeah. and this, whatever it is, it's going to be three or four times that. I want you to tell me how Green Bay got the twenty-five draft. Well, we were persistent. I think we started two thousand seventeen, uh, and I think it was about the two thousand nineteen draft, and we were persistent. Uh, kept talking about, uh, you know, obviously the history and tradition and the iconic nature of Lambeau Field. Quite honestly, where we are now, I, I think the Titletown development uh, was very helpful. Um, and when we started talking about it, it was just an idea. You know, now I think uh, we just celebrated our fifth, fifth anniversary here, and you can really see what it adds to, uh, to the ability to host a draft. And then, you know, also there's uh, uh, here the Brown County just built uh, – brand new uh, rest center, uh, which or it's, now it's the rest, rest Expo, that will be crucial to hosting the draft as well. And How many seats in there? Uh, I think for hockey and basketball, eight to 9,000, so they might have an – yeah, and you know this, uh, hasn't, haven't made a decision yet where the stage would be. That's up to the league. And but it's going to be in Lambeau, right? Well, that's the assumption. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of the centerpiece. Right. But you've seen the stage is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Hopefully they can squeeze it in a 100-yard football field. So, Mark, how do, you, how do you fit that many people in the smallest market in the NFL? Where will they sleep? <laughs> well, Where that's the, the hotel. Hotels how, how will the, that work? Hotel is the, hotels are the challenge. Uh, yeah, I think we have 8,000 hotels in the metropolitan Green Bay area. You mean 8,000 hotel rooms? Hotel rooms. Yeah, yeah, we don't have, yeah. <laughs> no, we don't have that many hotels. <laughs> We're going to start building a lot. So we have 8,000 rooms. Um, obviously, people are going to have to stay uh, Appleton, Oshkosh, Madison, Milwaukee. Um, so it'll be a little Milwaukee, different than that. Milwaukee, about going. hour 50 away? Uh, yeah, just under two hours. Yeah. Uh, we've also Madison, had a little, hour and little, a half? Uh, little over two hours. Two hours, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, we've also had some discussion. Obviously, Airbnb becoming more and more popular. Yeah. You'll see that. And um, we've also had them some discussions with cruise lines about bringing cruise ships uh, into uh, well, Green Bay. On the Bay. Fox River? Fox River, probably more Green Bay downtown. Uh, uh, we think the ice will have been melted by then. <laughs> <laughs> in August or in April. i, I got to tell you a story, Peter. Yeah. Uh, you probably know Peter O'Reilly from yeah. the league office. So I, I said, Peter, uh, you know, it's late April. We could have snow. And he said, that would be great. <laughs> so imagine, yeah. you know, uh, but uh, first round that, draft choice, John Smith walking up to the snow, coming walking down. up to the stage with the snow coming down. Yeah. Now it's, but you know, it's, it's kind of like, well, you know, this the, the the league and television networks love when they love when a game is played and snow coming down. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's it, it makes the game memorable. Yeah. But so mm. explain if. Fans usually descend on the draft <laughs> yeah. area. So let's say you're a fan and you want to come to the draft. You yeah. love the Packers. You always loved them. What will you do? Will you book a hotel in Milwaukee 
commute back and forth? How exactly will I, that I work? think that's it. I mean, uh, yeah, and then obviously the hotels here will be at a premium. I think they'll, those would be the first try. But, uh, yeah, I, I, in Airbnbs across the state, I know people are excited about the opportunity yeah. to have that. Yeah, probably Milwaukee. I mean, Milwaukee, obviously, they've hosted – national conventions and uh, have quite a few hotel rooms there. But um, the other thing we've talked about is um, working with Amtrak to get train service from uh, Milwaukee up to Green Bay Wow! for around the draft. Are there There are tracks. tracks to there do are that? tracks. You probably don't know this, Peter, but the National know. Railroad Museum is right here in Green Bay. That's crazy. Yep. That's, wow. But we don't have train service in Green Bay, so that's something we're that working on. That seems like they're not mutually <laughs> yeah, beneficial. Wow, that's interesting. So um, other than the money, yeah, obviously, that will flow into this area, yeah. why would you want the draft in Green Bay? <laughs> and it was really, it's more than the money. It's... It's the long-term effect and how this will impact Green Bay and, and really the state of Wisconsin. It's going to be like a two-week infomercial, a commercial for Wisconsin and Green Bay, uh, you know, and you know, especially with Titletown and Titletown, Titletown Tech now, you know, we're trying to draw as many people and businesses here to Green Bay and the you know, quality of life here and everything that we have going for us. Uh, but so, you know, the, the money, the economic impact, we think, across the state will be about $94 million, which is probably more than six times the impact of a normal Packers home game. So it, it, it'll be pretty significant. And we've had, you know, so many, we put together a, <coughs> a committee to, to help, you know, planning and getting ready to, to put on the, the draft. And, um yeah, and a lot of a lot of local companies are investing and in helping us because they know that obviously this is going to be great for the state, not just the week that everything occurs here, yeah. but long term. Uh, you know, I think you know people thinking about, geez, you know, maybe Green Bay is not such a bad place to live. Why do you think the league said yes? I think they got sick of us applying. <laughs> no, I, you know, I think it's going to be different. Obviously, you mentioned Chicago and Nashville and huge cities, um, and you know, and you know, the the kind of the the thought on the draft is really focus on cities that will never be able to host a Super Bowl, and obviously, we're never going to host a Super Bowl. Uh, so I think, you know, as there and you know, at, there, as you go through the cities, you know, you can see that's a potential. Um, but I think, in my mind, I think it's the history and tradition of Lambeau Field, the uniqueness of the Packers, you know, our ownership structure, um, and the fact that, you know, a team in a small town like Green Bay can compete with teams from New York and L.A. It's, uh, it's a great story, and I think it's a very positive uh, reflection on the league as a whole. Do you see... <clears throat> more events, more league events like the draft going to, for instance, next year it's Detroit, year after that yeah. Green Bay. Do you think eventually every city in the NFL gets a draft? Long term, yeah. I mean, other than, you know, again, kind of factoring in if you, if you get the, you know, if you get the Super Bowl, maybe, right. maybe you're down the list on. But yeah, I give, uh, you know, Peter O'Reilly from the league office who we mentioned before, he's done a great job, you know, just, uh, you know, I think he, he uses the term, you know, primetime events or, um, you know, tentpole events. And, you know, you think about it, it wasn't that long ago, the draft was really not a big deal. And what it's Everybody become, thought the league was nuts back in 2014. When they moved to, to uh, move it around. Yeah. What are you doing? Radio City. Capital of the world, yeah. red carpet, yeah. great. Everybody wants to come to New York. And within like two or three years, I just thought they were right. Now you see why, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just, it's that night in Philadelphia where the wide angle on the TV, you couldn't see any space. It was all people. Yeah. The time in Nashville where there's 600,000 people. Mm. It's just, it's, you know, for whatever, whatever you might say about the NFL, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, it truly is a national phenomenon. No, I, I agree with you. And Peter O'Reilly's working on the next draft. What'll be? What'll be? <laughs> well, they've got uh, welcome back. Is it 
back again Saturday or the oh, back, back again <laughs> weekend or something. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's it seems to be insatiable. You know, yeah. the, you know, you look at like you know the Netflix shows and people not only watch the games but you know they want to know you know what goes on behind the scenes and uh, I think those of us that work in the NFL realize how fortunate we are. Yeah. I'll end with this. You mentioned earlier, and we're sitting right here in this building, Title Town Tech, which until I got here this summer, I never heard of Title Town Tech, had no idea what it is. What is it, and what role does it play in the future of the Green Bay Packers? Yeah, it's it's a great question. It's uh, Title Town Tech. It's our partnership with Microsoft, so established by the Packers and Microsoft, um, and it's a venture it's going to it'll it'll invest in uh you know startup companies a venture capital firm or fund uh we've had two two raises of funds uh, the most recent one we raised 70 million and we're investing in startup companies and we've had so far we've had a pretty good uh, some really good results companies that are com- and the other the other hope is that they would all be in Wisconsin or Green Bay establish and and uh, grow um yeah, and I, you know, I give a lot of credit to Microsoft. Just the credibility that they bring is is phenomenal. And uh, Brad Smith, their CEO, just happens to be from Appleton, Wisconsin, which is about 20 minutes from here, and it's a big Packer fan. But they they have, uh, I think they call it, you know, they wanted to kind of really focus on technology away from the West Coast and the East Coast, and kind of Green Bay was they thought a really good place to kind of focus on the Midwest where there's some some great technology and innovations going on and uh, Title Town Tech is a big part of that. What role does it play in hopefully for you financing part of your future? <laughs> hopefully a large role um, and and you know this Peter I mean the the league is in a great position now we have long-term collective bargain agreement we have long-term TV deals but that might not always be the case. And uh, if we go get in a situation where you don't share revenue equally, a team in Green Bay would be at a disadvantage. So um, investing in these startup companies and working with uh, Microsoft and Title Town Tech puts us in a position where long-term, if things do change, we're still able to compete. And you know, part of what makes Green Bay special is it's a 10 minute commute for almost everybody. So we don't want, you know, you got, you want planned growth, but uh, this is a great place to live. And I think uh, if you bring, if you have the right companies and the right leaders in those positions, uh, you can have a lot of success. Do you think there's a chance that some year down the road that equal revenue sharing will not exist in the NFL? (laughs) I hope not. Um, You know, I think, in my mind, that's kind of what has set the league apart from, right. you know, you look at the other leagues where it's uh, the combination of revenue sharing and then the salary cap has been crucial for the league. And uh, and it's worked so well. And, and I don't have to tell you, I mean, you look at the, the broadcast networks, I mean, 88 of the top 100 shows last year were NFL games. And so it's, uh, and, you know, more, a higher percentage as we go forward, as or over the last 10 years, the percentage of our revenue that is national has grown. So I think that really says a lot about the stability of the league. So um, while we're in really good shape now, things you know things can change pretty quickly. You know, you look at outside of sports and particularly football. You know, people aren't watching TV the way they used to. It's you know all streaming and isn't uh, it isn't it amazing that. There's a great story in the New York Times about how ESPN between uh, 2013 and 2027 will basically decrease in the number of houses that I they're in that. Yeah. by about yeah. 60%. Yeah. And so it's almost like you can't count on anything yeah. that, that you thought was a forever thing, yeah. you know? So. No, so, you're right, but yeah. yeah. Knock on wood, somewhere the league is in very sound financial shape now, and popularity is kind of at an all-time high, and hopefully it can continue. But things are changing, and I, you know, I think that's where I give Roger and people in the league office a lot of credit. Is 
you know, they know we're in a good position now, but they're also planning for the future. Mark Murphy, president of the Packers, thanks a lot for joining me. It's always a pleasure. It's great to have you here in Green Bay, Peter. Thank you, Mark. My thanks to Mark Murphy for taking the time. And as always, my thanks to Miles Simmons for making sense of this National Football League, which as at the start of the 104th season has its usual head scratching things that you just can't make sense of. But anyway, we will be back in uh, in one week to try to make a little bit more sense of the NFL. And one thing I always like about week two in the NFL is that it really gives you time to uh, basically make some decent judgments about the NFL season. And the one team I will be watching in week two, especially closely, is the New York Giants. Because I think that the New York Giants going to Arizona, there is no team in the NFL that has a more important game in week two than the New York Giants playing at the Arizona Cardinals. Because you lose to the Cardinals, and then I think we know what kind of season it's going to be for the New York Giants. Anyway. Miles Simmons and I will be back for another edition of the Peter King Podcast next week. Have a great week, everyone. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.